Good evening. We are happy to have with us tonight Mark, N4DR, who is a member of our Montgomery Amateur Radio Club, as well as our vice president. Mark and another member, Bob, AK3Y, are currently conducting workshops to help hams build their own J-pole antennas. Judging from the glowing comments received after the first workshop, it was a great success. So Mark is with us tonight to explain why you too should want a J-pole. So thanks, Mark, for joining us tonight. And now it's over to you. Okay, thank you, Alex. So let me get screen share up here and share. Okay, and move this around a little bit. Okay, and now we do a little magic here. There we go. Does everybody see that? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, a little introduction is probably uh, appropriate for this talk. Uh, J-pole antennas have been around for a long time. I think Bob did some research and found out that uh, the first uh, uh, J-poles were actually built in the 1920s. And it wasn't for, you know, two meters or VHF or UHF. It was for HF, interestingly enough. Needless to say, those were pretty big antennas. Well, the antennas that we're going to talk about tonight are uh, J-poles that are designed to be simple yet effective and that you can build yourself using really minimal materials. And we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what they are and what they look like and uh, uh, as uh, Alex noted, we've had one uh, build session, shall we say. We have another one uh, scheduled for this coming Sunday. Uh, both of those are, were fully subscribed, but uh, if anyone is interested, uh, we can and we'll be glad to set up a third session, probably sometime in March, so that uh, people who uh, see the presentation and think that they might want to join with us and build their own J-poles which is a lot of fun, by the way. And uh, Bob is very good about providing the educational background uh, as to the theory behind them and how to build them, how to adjust them and so forth. Okay, let's go to our first slide here. Uh, this slide is courtesy of uh, Ed Fong, uh, WB6DQN, who uh, has written several papers in QST concerning uh, J-poles. And this was his second paper uh, where he showed a design for a dual band J-pole. What we're looking at here right now is a single band J-pole uh, designed for two meters. And uh, as you can see, it's really, really a simple thing to make. Uh, you have to connect a 50 ohm coax here. It doesn't have to be RG174. It can even be RG58, or if you want, RG213, but it has to be uh, uh, soldered here. You have to short the bottom, which is here, and then the dimensions are given. So let's say you use this uh, antenna, you make this antenna rather, and let's say the SWR is not so good. Well, you come over here to the top of the uh, J-pole quarter wave stub, and you can either increase it if the frequency is too high, or you can decrease it if the frequency is too low. So, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, let's go to the next slide. Oop, too fast. All right, there we go. Okay, so this uh, uh, diagram shows you um, something that we're gonna talk a little bit about here in a few minutes, and that is, where is your signal going? Well, if you want to use a repeater or you want to talk to another ham on simplex, it's awfully good that your uh, signal be horizontal instead of up in uh, at a high angle. So this graph uh, displays what the standard one band two meter J pole looks like and if you notice, the red indicates what the uh, um, angle of takeoff is for the or elevation plane pattern for two meters. 
that's pretty good. It's going off to the right and off to the left. And while there is some energy going upward, uh, there's not a lot. Most of it is going to the right or to the left. In consequence, when you use the two meter J pole on 70 centimeters, you got a problem. You see the majority of the energy is going up at 45 degrees. Well, that's not very helpful if you want to work a repeater or talk to your friend uh, down the street on simplex because the signal is going up at 45 degrees so or 44 degrees. So that's not very useful. And that's one of the reasons that a two meter J pole is not really very good on 440. People say, oh, it works on 440, sort of. But we're going to see that that's not really true. It does work, but it's pretty bad. OK, now this uh, design here is a dual band J pole. Um, this was the original uh, dual band J pole. And they, this was designed to fit inside a piece of uh, PVC piping and therefore allow you to uh, uh, set up the uh, antenna outdoors. And I'll show you a picture of that. And uh, encased in PVC piping, obviously, this antenna is very rugged and can withstand bad weather and that sort of thing. And as long as the PVC pipe doesn't get knocked off its tower or house or wherever you have it mounted, the antenna is protected from the weather. Now, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that the numbers here are a little bit different than on the earlier slide. There's two reasons for that. One is this is actually a dual band, uh, dual band J pole. And uh, we're assuming that it's in a class 200 PVC pipe, because if you put the J pole into a pipe, it changes a number of the characteristics uh, of the lengths and so on. So you have to be adjusted accordingly. Now, the J poles that we're making are designed to be not put into a PVC pipe. OK, here's your uh, PVC pipe. And as you can see, it's, well, it's sealed at the top and sealed at the bottom. And there's a uh, SO236 connector here. And needless to say, this is pretty rugged. This will stand up to some really nasty weather as long as it does not get knocked down. And uh, this is sealed up here. And the, the top cap is uh, 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 sealed with glue. So it's really protected from the elements. OK, so this is the design that uh, we built for double uh, dual band J pole. And uh, not everyone interestingly in the class wanted a double band J pole. Several people, uh, some of the beginners said, well, it was complicated enough for them to build a single band. So many of them did just that. But this one is designed to work on both two meters and 440 and to work well on 440. And again, the, if you notice, the numbers here are uh, a little bit different than the previous slide, be, again, because this is not intended to be put into a PVC pipe. And uh, also, the exact dimensions vary with the manufacturer of the 300 ohm line, especially the tap point where the RG174 feed line is connected, which is down here. But uh, having said that, a good place to start would be to connect it at one and a quarter inches from the end here, the end of the insulation, not the end of the splice. But this splice usually just goes right across here, but uh, they have it sticking out like this to emphasize uh, that it is shorted. So uh, this is the dual band antenna. Let's go through the different pieces. Well, first of all, a J pole is really a dipole. You say dipole? Well, the reason it got its name J pole, if you look where my pointer is going, makes a J. Okay. This is the quarter wave stub for two meters. And this is the quarter wave stub for 440. So again, uh, you construct this the way this is shown here. And you can use these measurements as a starting point. Now, this here is very interesting. This is a quarter wave trap on 440 megahertz. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, a quarter wave um, stub on 440 looks like an open circuit to the 440 energy. The energy on two meters looks at it and says, eh, it's just a wire, don't worry. <laughs> so if this is properly cut, then the section here, oh, sorry about that, go back. Uh, the section here basically becomes the 440 portion of the antenna, okay? Because any 440 energy reaching here, it's like it's an open circuit. So how do you tune the antenna? Well, it's really very simple. Uh, this uh, here is uh, made of a length of 50 ohm coax. Now it doesn't have to be RG174, that happens to be what we're using, but uh, it doesn't have to be that. In fact, I did some experimentation with just good old garden variety RG58, which is a 50 ohm uh, impedance coax, and with some different lengths that can uh, work as well. But it has to be a quarter wave on uh, 440 in order for it to work well on 440. So uh, we can make it longer or shorter. And the only thing you have to make longer or shorter is not the center conductor. That can stay as it is. What you can do if it's too short, for example, is you can solder a wire here and have it hang down like that and then begin see where it is in the uh, uh, frequency range on 440 using an SWR bridge or nano VNA or an antenna analyzer, whatever you happen to have. And let's say it's uh, too low in frequency. Let's say uh, instead of being 440, it's 439. Well, that's actually not a bad thing because you can take your wire cutters and snip off an eighth of an inch at a time and slowly bring the antenna to the exact frequency that you're interested in on 440. Now this thing over here, this is the two meter notch. And if you remember, let's go back a little bit here, this notch is here on the two meter. And to tune the two meter notch, uh, two meter side of the antenna, we merely snip off here. And the same thing applies. If, for example, the uh, frequency is too low, you can snip off, snip off, snip off, shortening it to raise the desired frequency on that you're reading on your antenna analyzer or your nano VNA. If it's too short, and uh, we deliberately cut our notches a little bit higher than what is called for here, simply because it's easier to cut wire off than it is to add wire. So uh, this is the, the dual band J pole that we built or some of us built and other people built the single band. Now, this is called the decoupling stub here for uh, 440 and this stub here for two meters. And this is where the um, coax attaches. Now, most of us use either electrical tape or shrink to cover those areas. Shrink tubing is a plastic tubing that you uh, put over an area you wanna protect and then you take a hair dryer or a soldering iron and use heat to shrink it down. So that not only protects it from the weather, but it also makes it um, uh, sealed so that it's a stronger connection. And in this case, underneath here is the 440 stub we talked about. Now, this is my favorite slide. I think it's important that we look at this slide to get an idea of exactly why a J-pole is better than a rubber duck. So let's say, for example, a quarter wave ground plane with four radials, we'll call that the reference. Now, what is a quarter wave ground plane? Well, you can make a simple quarter wave ground plane by simply taking a 19 inch piece of wire and soldering it to the center pin of a SO236 connector. And the four holes that are designed to hold the SO236 connector onto a bulkhead or something, you don't put those onto a bulkhead. You connect 
four 19 inch radials, one to each corner of the connector. So there you have a quarter wave ground plane with four radials. Now look at this, VHF flexible antenna, minus 5.9 dB. Well, for those who uh, uh, understand uh, dB, uh, you realize that this is very severe attenuation. 3 dB cuts the signal strength in half, 6 dB cuts it even half again. So let's say you have five watts coming out of your HT. The first 3D cut it down to 2.5 and the second uh, power output. And uh, the second one cuts it down to about 1.25 watts. This is why flexible antennas are not good. Now, here's a standard VHF J pole. Now, it's certainly not this, but it's not a lot of gain either, but it is a little bit of gain. Okay, this is uh, the standard one. And notice there's really no difference in uh, dB level with the dual band. These two guys are the same. Now, where it really shines, again, is on 440. So we have the ground plane that we're using as reference. And the flexible antenna, the loss is not as bad as it is over here, but it's, it's bad. It's almost half your power is being wasted. And standard VHF J pole on 440, look at that. So when people say, yeah, my VHF J pole works on 440, yeah, not very well. You're losing essentially half your power as you are over here. Now, where the dual band J pole shines is while you don't get much gain, half a dB is not much over the reference, but it's better than this. <laughs> So you're, you're definitely ahead with the dual band if you want to use the antenna you're making on 440. Okay, and, and this basically is the same information, just put in a different variety. Uh, reference here, receive signal strength. The, uh, um, the larger the, the minus number, the weaker the signal. So if you look at it uh, as a receive, uh, on the receive side of things, if you have a signal that's uh, uh, minus 100 dBm, that's a lot weaker than a signal that's minus 24.7 dBm. So, but again, this is basically the same information put in a different way. Uh, difference from reference, we're calling reference zero dB, uh, rubber duck antenna, obviously 5.8 dB, not good. Standard VHF J pole, okay. On VHF, it's all right, uh, and, but the dual band is even better. Coming down here, relative performance at 440 megahertz, you have your reference, you have a, your uh, or rubber duck or flex antenna. It's even worse on 440. I mean, on two meters, it's bad enough, <laughs> but on 440, it's even worse. And standard J-pole is not so great on 440 either, and uh, the dual band J pole is basically the same as a, the reference antenna. So while you don't get anything from this dual band, you don't lose anything either. Okay, that is the, um, the uh, presentation that I have. And uh, I'd like to see uh, Bob, AK3Y, are you here? I can't see the, um, the screen. I'm going to go out now from uh, uh, screen sharing unless someone has a question about any of the slides. Does anyone have any questions about any of the slides? Fred, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm just curious, um, this slide and the previous slide. So on the previous slide, I thought it said that a standard VHF J pole and the dual band J pole were the same, but on the second slide after this, it showed that they were different. And I'm not sure I understand, is it one because one's measured and the other is sort of theoretical or? Um, no, these are, uh, the earlier ones were uh, theoretical. Uh, I'm sorry, were measured, but uh, the uh, second ones are also measured. I guess it's just a different way of 
of presenting the same information. Um, you have to remember here that this is on 440 and this is on two meters. And that's why the standard J-pole is so bad on 440, whereas it's a little better than reference on two meters. I think that may be the area that uh, it potentially is confusing. It, did that answer your question, Fred? No, actually it's it's up. If you just look at the 440 or the two meter stuff. Yeah. On the two meter one on the previous slide, the standard J pole, VHF J pole, and the, um, maybe it wasn't the DBJ. Yeah, it was a dual band. So, so on that one, it says a standard VHF J pole and a dual band J pole are the same for two meters. But on the next slide, it said the standard VHF J pole did not perform as well as the dual band. So I was just kind of curious about that. Um, I really don't have an answer for you, but you're 100% okay. correct. <laughs> um, okay. uh, you're absolutely right. I think, again, depends on how you're measuring it and so on. Um, I, I think, as we talked about, each antenna is a little bit different. And perhaps uh, the measurements here were done on a different antenna uh, build that uh, they were doing. So I don't know the answer to your question, but you're absolutely right. I think the main takeaway message from this whole process is that you need to be able to realize that this is very lossy. This is even more lossy uh, for a, uh, uh, an antenna that does not have the dual band capability. So let's go back to the first one, Oop, too far. So uh, the point of all this is the flexible antenna, you're losing a lot of power, particularly on, um, on uh, two meters and the flexible antenna being the rubber duck. And the standard VHF J pole, you get some gain on uh, 146 and some gain on uh, uh, the uh, dual bander as well. But over here, it's really interesting that funny enough on the uh, flexible antenna, the loss is not as bad as it is over here on two meters. And the probable reason for that is that the antenna itself is physically shorter. <laughs> and uh, standard VHF J pole on 440 Again, we're looking at a lot of loss, just as you are over here. And the dual band J-pole has a small amount of gain, but at least you're not losing anything. Does that answer your question, uh, Fred? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's very clear that um, the flexible antennas really are not very good at all. And the other thing is, if you are going to do two meters and 440, be sure to have a dual band because 440 on it. Uh, VHF J pole isn't doing any good either. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's exactly correct. Okay, over to Joe. Uh, um, uh, good evening to Mark and the group. I just have a question about um, has has there ever been a comparison between the 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 kind of of uh, j pole that that the uh, uh, club is building with the with the the uh, twin lead and the the rigid uh kind of of uh, uh j poles like the ones that are uh commercially uh made has 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 there ever been a uh a uh comparison of of uh those two kinds of uh j poles um i i haven't seen anything but 
I would suggest to you that the figures that you see on these slides, uh, if the J-pole is constructed correctly and tuned properly, that the main advantage of the metal J-poles is that uh, they're more rugged on outdoors, uh, particularly in cold weather or wet weather, et cetera. They're, they're more rugged. However, this J-pole, as you saw, can also, if it's placed inside a PVC pipe, uh, be worthwhile for um, uh, outdoor use as well. So as far as comparison, I would suspect, although I can't say for sure, that both are assuming they're both properly tuned, and that's a big if, you have to check and make sure they're tuned properly, they should have similar performance uh, uh, between the two. Does that answer your question, Joe? Good. Uh, uh, yes, it does. Uh, thank you, Mark. Okay, sure. Okay, David, W2LNX. I'm curious about making a JPO using um, zip uh, zip cord, electrical cord, lap cord, because Bob made a comment that spacing between the left and right side is not that critical. And, you know, twin lead is kind of hard to find. I mean, you used to be able to go to Radio Shack, get, you know, get a small roll of 300 ohm twin lead, um, but zip cord. I know people have successfully made uh, dipoles out of a zip cord, balanced antennas, of course, and then you try uh, tie an electrical knot at the feed point so that it doesn't completely co uh, come apart. Um, hmm, worth worth trying. So, well, that's yeah. that's an interesting idea. I, I never really thought of that. Um, I would say first of all that you don't have to have. 300 ohm twin lead to build a J-pole. Uh, obviously the metal J-poles we, we all know about and that's not not, uh, not a uh, issue in question. But uh, the latter line, similar to uh, what you see in um, Alex's screen on the left side, uh, that uh, can be made from a J-pole, uh, make a J-pole as well, that type of uh, lead in. And to carry the step one step further, you could make your own twin lead. So for example, uh, and I'm just pulling this out of the air, uh, if you wanted to take two wires and you had plastic pieces to keep the wire separated, sort of like a ladder, if you will, then there's no reason that you couldn't make a J-pole out of that. The only problem is the mechanical stability at the cuts at the cutouts would be an issue that would have to be addressed. In other words, you'd have to put it up on uh, some means of securing the uh, uh, the wires, because otherwise they'd flop around if you uh, cut the notches that you need to cut. And uh, so, uh, in theory, that's fine. I I don't know about a a, a twin lead. I mean, a a zip cord or AC power cord. It would be an interesting experiment, but I suspect what we would find is that uh, a lot of the measurements would be very, very different. And the reason I say that is that the velocity factor, which I'm not going to go into now because that's a little complicated, uh, between say zip cord, 300 ohm line, and 450 ohm line, and my example of homemade li open line, uh, are all very, very different. And that's uh, something that would have to be taken into account for. And you could calculate the uh, necessary uh, measurements using a computer formula like EasyNEC or something of that ilk. Does that answer your question, Dave? Yeah. In fact, uh, Bob mentioned in the beginning, you can determine the velocity factor uh, by basically cutting a piece and you keep cutting it down until it becomes um, an open impedance, um, or actually, no, you do a half wave. Uh, so you have what comes in, if it's 50 ohms at one end, there'll be 50 ohms at the other end. So you, you, they, you, you get an estimate uh, experimentally. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, velocity fact, things that uh, speed of light in materials is a fraction of the speed of light. 
And sometimes it goes down to like 60% of the speed of light. It's amazing. But the speed of light is very slow anyway. For, so yeah. it doesn't make. <laughs> yeah, well, for those of us who um, uh, attended the conference uh, or the uh, not conference, the get together on Sunday, uh, Bob, AK3Y, does a much better explanation of things like velocity factor and uh, measurement of length and so on. Okay, next on the uh, hands up list is David, KO4 Papa Zulu Whiskey. Uh, go ahead, David. All right. Uh, just going back to Fred's question, I, I don't know if it makes a difference, but it looked like between the two slides, the, uh, the reference antenna might be different. I'm sorry, I, I had a little noise here in the shack. Could you repeat your question? Yeah, I was going back to, to Fred's question, um, and I was I did observe, I think there might be a difference between the reference antennas between the two slides. Yes. And that might account for the difference. Um, yeah. I, again, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, it could be that, certainly, and it could be uh, two different antennas that were measured. Uh, see, the, the key point is you want the antenna to work at the frequency that you're going to be using it. So, for example, the J-poles that we make are usually mounted vertically, and vertical polarization is what we use in uh, FM. So you'd want to cut the J-pole for the higher part of the two-meter band or the higher part of the uh, 440 band because that's where you're going to be operating. Now, if you were going to use it, say, for weak signal work on two meters or 440, you would cut it for the low end of the band. I'm not sure that this antenna would be so great for weak signal work because you need some kind of gain antenna to be successful with that. But uh, I guess what I'm saying is it has to be tuned to the frequency that you're going to use it on. And different materials have different uh, velocity factors, different materials have different uh, length requirements, and you need to be able to measure where the antenna is after you build it and make it either longer or shorter, depending on what the frequency is. If the frequency is too low, you shorten the stub. The frequency is too high, you lengthen the stub. Uh, go ahead, Fred. Fred, you're on yeah, mute. One, yeah, um, so uh, one other sort of comment that might be of interest to newer hams that uh, don't really understand some of the concept about gain and loss. So. You know, there's sort of like everybody knows there's this um, uh, sort of law of conservation of energy, right? Like, you know, you have a certain amount of energy and, and you know, you can't just have it vanish. It's, it's got to go somehow. So we have a certain amount of like RF energy, let's just say five watts on, on two meters. And so conceptually, we can understand or I could understand or everybody I think could understand it. If you have like a flexible antenna and you lose some of the power, that energy is going somewhere and it's probably just getting dissipated as heat because it's not radiating, radiating out the antenna where you want it to go and it's just being lost as heat. But the concept of like a positive gain, um, that sort of implies somehow you're somehow getting energy from somewhere it doesn't. And um, I know it took me a long time before I kind of understood that that was not the case. So I just wondered maybe you might want to also explain why that why you actually get gain and and sort of it's not really that you're like doubling your power, but it's yeah. No, um, I I uh, jump back to this slide because this a a I think adds part of the explanation. Certainly, as you pointed out, if the antenna is not resonant on the frequency that you want it to be resonant on, uh, some of the energy is going to be lost in the heat. But if you look at this diagram, as we said, if you want to work a repeater or your friend down the street, you want the signal to be horizontal or heading out at a re relatively low angle of radiation. So when I say gain, if you think of it as, okay, in this case, it does poorly on four, uh, 70 centimeters because look where it's going. It's not going where you want it, okay? It's, it's going elsewhere. And no, uh, the uh, J-pole antenna does not defy the laws of physics. <laughs> so 
I guess one way to sort of put this in perspective is, let's say, for example, that you're using a J-pole antenna and uh, you're comparing it with a ground uh, quarter wave, for example, ground plane. So you hook it up to the ground plane antenna and your buddy who's listening to you will note a certain reading on his S meter. And then if you switch over to the J-pole, you will notice the increase reading on the S meter. Now, we haven't suddenly created energy where there was no energy before, but we're directing it into a more useful direction as opposed to having it go up into the sky. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that was exactly the thing that took me for a long time early on as I was a ham to understand um, how that worked. So it's like, you know, where's this extra power coming from? But you're right. Yeah, that and that's what it is. It's the that's how the power is radiated in the right direction such that the recipient gets it as opposed to it just going off into where it's not needed anywhere. Right. Okay. Um, if there are no additional questions, then I think I will shut down on the screen share and turn it. What? Well, we've got one question here. Go ahead, Hank. You're on mute. Okay. How, how am I? How's my audio? Your audio is fine right now. Okay. Very good. Um, it's a, more of a comment than a question. So uh, if you're going to take comments a little later, that'll be fine. I can do it then. No, you can go ahead now. There's no oh, to okay. all right. For those that might be interested in knowing that Fong also did a design and published it in the March 2017 QST for a two meter, one and a quarter meter, and of course the 70 centimeter, or in other words, two meters, 220 and 440 um, as a tri-band J-pole. So if you look to the March 2017 QST, you will find that uh, built and design and discussion. Yes, that's very helpful. And uh, basically, to boil it down, all you would need to have a tri-band uh, J-pole would be uh, to have another uh, trap for whatever the band is that you're interested in. And so instead of having a two meter quarter wave and a 440 quarter wave, you could also have a quarter wave stub for 220, but we're kind of getting off tangent here. All right, I'm going to uh, shut down on screen share. And let's see how I can arrange for that. Okay, so uh, back to uh, Alex. Great. Terrific presentation. Thank you, Mark, so much. Thank and, you. Uh, we will, hold on one sec. So, oh, and I want to thank you for taking time to do this and for all your great work for the club. So thanks very much.